Dragons and Unicorns present Making the Red Queen's Crown. You'll need A to have seen our video on making a crown base, one already made crown base, gold metallic fabric. I used two squares of 26 by 18 inches or 66 by 46 centimeters. You'll also need PVA glue, heart shaped flat back jewels, six millimeter red and clear flat back jewels, white bridle looping and colored LED waterproof battery lights. You can also use whatever color seems best, but at the client's request, we used white. This is the original image that the full costume is based on and a close-up of the crown that we're replicating for her. Here you can see my crown base that we made in the tutorial and I'll place the link for that in the descriptions below. I've taken the pattern that I made to the client and double checked the measurements and height and then marked the details on it. She only wanted white lights rather than coloured ones and decided to go with the original images design which I've drawn on here for shape and size reference. I've put my two sheets of gold fabric onto my board with the wrong sides facing and normally you'd put them right sides facing but I want all my markings to show ready for cutting out. I'm using my old kitchen cupboard shelf again to mark and cut the fabric for the basis cover as you can see here. And I've carefully put the fabric on it, stretching it out so there are no wrinkles or bumps before I mark the cutting lines. Once you're happy with the flatness of the fabric, put the pattern on top of it and ensure that that also lays perfectly flat and correct. I've recently started using some washed stones from the garden as pattern weights and because they're so heavy and solid they'll keep the pattern still while I mark it with the pen. Although the pattern will stay in place, Sometimes when I lean across a board, I move the fabric by accident, so remember to keep double checking for movement, flattening it perfectly before carrying on. I'm drawing around the shape, being very careful not to move the fabric while I do it. Any mistakes here will mean the fabric won't fit properly on the crown base. When you find the pen fitting against the pattern, Keep it going in one sweeping motion until you get to the end and double check by carefully lifting the corner of the pattern that the lines can actually be seen. Carry on all the way around the edges until you finish the shape completely. When you're happy it's all been done, you can remove the pattern and start the next phase. I've smoothed the fabric out again and checked the lines, but they're not showing up as well as I'd hoped. So I'm going to use a permanent marker like this red one or the black one to go over the lines once more so I can see them easier. As you can see, I've been careful to keep both pieces of the gold very flat. They're actually sticking together because they do hold a great deal of static electricity, which unusually enough works in my favor for a change. I'm putting my stones on the top of the fabric in the corners and center to try and keep it still while cutting both layers out as any movement will ruin the final look. And when the fabric weights are down and I've put the lids on my pens, I double check that it's flat and unwrinkled before putting an extra seam allowance around the edge using my small guide ruler set at one inch or 2.5 centimeters width. You'll see later on why we need the extra fabric around the edges. Remember as you mark around that you need to go slowly and keep an eye on any movements in the fabric. Keep straightening it so any errors in cutting are kept to an absolute minimum. After all, good preparation prevents poor performance. This all does take a lot of time, but it will be worth it in the end as it won't be as liable to stretching out of shape. I'm working on both edges here in small sections at a time. Now I've moved to the top edge and I'll do that section first. It means I've only got to move each of the stones once rather than doing it over and over again and re-straightening the fabric. 
So as that's going to take too long to show you on the video, I'm jumping forward to where all the dots have been joined up and the lines are filled in and straightened on the fabric. The lines are finished and I'm doing one last straightening out before using my small embroidery scissors to cut the shape. I've still got the stones in place so their weight will keep the fabric nice and still. After all, as there's only markings on the top layer, any movement will ruin the underside. Most people would rather use a rotary cutter here instead of scissors, which would also cut down on any movement, but I'm not a rotary cutter fan as the arthritis in my wrist doesn't allow as much movement as I used to have. I shifted the stones as I worked, making sure the wrinkles are removed as I go. I'm cutting with very small snips each time and that means I can be more accurate and again I cut slowly to keep the shape and make sure the edge stays nice and crisp and sharp. As you can see the fabric moves very easily and I'll make another cut in the video to where all the edges are finished and I'm ready to move on to the next stage. Here we have the crown shape all cut out. I've put the excess fabric to one side but kept it handy for use later. I've got the two pieces cut out and I need to separate them. I want to use the piece without the lines on as the facing side of the crown so the marked one can go onto the inside and I'll push that to one side. I've got the crown base here and the back seams are marked with red marker. I hope you can see the seams where the two ends have made an obvious join. Picking up the fabric, I'm just checking the fit. You need to find the centre front of both the crown and the fabric and then lay the fabric onto the base. It looks a bit awkward, but that's because I'm trying to do it for the best angle for the camera. You can do it a lot more easily. You can see how well it goes onto the base, but I'm checking for any slight imperfections that might show on the finished crown now the fabric's on top of it. I'm pleased with how it's looking and hopefully you can see how smooth it is. If there had been any imperfections, I'd have used a little bit of plaster filling and sanded it to a smooth finish. Before I put the glue on the crown, I need to make sure I've got the front facing me. I've accidentally dropped the fabric into my PVA glue. Oops! But luckily, there's only a small corner affected and I won't really need to worry about it. The PVA glue can only go on in very small applications as too much glue will come through the fabric and spoil that glossy surface. I'm using a thickish paintbrush to paint the glue onto the base, but I need to double check that I've not left behind any stray bristles or lumps of dried PVA. I'm spreading the glue as finely as possible, but not so thin as to prevent the fabric from sticking at all. It was a fairly warm room that I was working in this day, so I did another very thin coat of PVA keeping it moving on the surface before checking it again for lumps and bumps. Having already dropped a corner into the glue, I've moved the PVA out of harm's way. You can see the thin layer of glue glistening in the sun. To make it easy for you to put the fabric onto the crown, I've tried to face it towards the camera and weighted it down with one of my garden stones. I then realised I can't work at that angle so I've turned it back to face me. I'm trying to ensure the spilled glue doesn't spread and cause an even bigger problem. To avoid that, I'm keeping the fabric as well spread as I can and carefully put it on top. I'm trying to handle it as little as possible to avoid any splits or tears and making sure the glue doesn't make marks on the fabric and ruin the shine. I have to take my time placing the first part of the fabric as if I don't get it right any mistakes will become 
glaringly obvious. I'm gently smoothing out any air bubbles and wrinkles, but using as little pressure as possible. Pressing down hard on that crown will cause the base to buckle and the fabric will shift and bubble. Now I'm happy that the fabric's sitting evenly without folds, I can move it slightly back off of the first piece of glue and move on to the next section. Again, I'm doing this with a great deal of care as the last thing I want is a line of glue ruining the look of the crown. When you put a lot of work into something like this, you really don't want to spoil it by rushing and making a mess. I'm spreading the glue to the edge of the crown, but trying to avoid spilling it over the top or base as that would create drips and runs which would dry in lumps and bumps on the surface of the fabric. So I'm checking again for any problems as I go. Putting a flat object on a curved surface means that you'll end up with bumps and extra pieces of fabric that won't lie flat. So the placing of this next piece on the crown needs to be done with checking and double checking for any problems. My dad was a chief petty officer in the Royal Navy and always told me not to sink the ship for a ha'porth of tar. So I've learned to take my time over working with anything I create and you can see here I've got no air bubbles or folds. Checking again and again is obviously paying off dividends. However, the corner that dropped in the PVA has come back to haunt me and I'm having to replace it very carefully. You can see how it's showing up as the glue starts to dry, which is definitely not what I want. You can see here what I mean about not placing the fabric carefully enough, creating folds and extra lumps of material. It can only get worse if I leave it as I work around the crown. The only solution is to carefully peel and replace the fabric before the PVA becomes too sticky and the fabric tears. It'll take a moment or two to readjust the fabric and keep it moving into its proper place without ripping or stretching it. But think of this as a marathon and not a sprint. Time and care taken now will pay off dividends in the long run. Top tip alert, keep your offcuts of fabric and you can use them to smooth your material without leaving fingerprints or marks. I've used that excess with the gold foils together to even out any air bubbles and soak up any glue that's coming through the fabric. Looking overall at the crown so far, I am super pleased with the result. I'm going to cut the next bit from the video as it's just repeating the gluing down of the fabric on the opposite side, leaving the gap at the back. I've left the crown to dry for a couple of days whilst I worked on another part of the costume and I'll be back in a moment. The crown's dry and ready to have the base glued down. I'm very pleased with the way it's dried and particularly that it's kept its shine. You can see the glue set really well here and the fabric's not going to come off under a little stress. There's a little ridge where the back joins have overlapped but I'm not too worried about those as they'll be at the very back of the costume anyway and mostly won't be seen. When I put the extra material over itself you can see how it shows that line but it's not a problem as there will be some beading which will help to diffuse that look anyway. There's going to be a set of lights going around the top edge of the crown. Now the client has chosen the white ones because she felt that other colours would interfere with the look of the overall outfit. These are the lights the client and I decided on and they're available on the usual large auction site. I've got to place them around the top of the crown, something like this. They come in a long twisted string and I've folded and retwisted them very carefully so as not to break the wires. They are now a quarter of their actual length. 
there's enough wire between the battery pack and the first light that it will sit happily inside the client's hood without showing. And the battery pack is small enough not to cause a problem because of weight or size. I've sped this bit up a bit as it's just showing the gluing. I so wish that I could work at this speed normally. Having glued the first piece of the back material, I'll now show you how the top section of the fabric will be folded down to have the white bridal looping glued onto it. At the moment, I'm not actually sure whether the looping will be fitted to the front or the inside of the crown. And these are the kinds of decisions you can make during the build. Remember, nothing's written in stone unless you're able to go for 100% accuracy, of course. And for that, you'll need bottomless pockets. But something else to consider, other than the overall look of your accessory, is just how practical is it? Does it look as you thought it would? Is it a danger to the wearer? Is there another way it can be done? I'm weaving the lights through the looping to check that they'll look right and how much work they'll be to fit if the client needs to replace them. But I'm happy with how much light they're giving off here and just testing it against the dark of my jumper. Twenty-four hours later, I've put the second half of the back layer on and it's ready to have the clips done. As you can see, the gold has stayed beautifully glued down and it's nice and even all round the bottom and the top. I'm cutting the curves here so that when I glue the extra allowance down, it'll give a lovely neat edge without any lumps and bumps. I start with quite wide clips and work all the way round the top, but you may need to cut them in half again to get that really smooth edge. I clip all the curves but not tips of the crown and I'll show you why later. I've cut all the top curves but left the back overlaps as they'll need to be trimmed before gluing down. You can see they're slightly narrower than the first clips that I did and the pointed tips I've left so that they can be folded and cut to lay in the best looking way. The back of the crown still needs the excess cutting off so I'm using my sharp embroidery scissors to trim that down. I'll do it by holding both pieces of fabric at once and cutting them together at the same height to meet the allowance on each side. When both sides are trimmed I'll cut the clips into the back curves and glue those down too. The clipped curves can now be glued down, but I'm using a small finer brush and then pressing the edges down onto the PVA. All the clipped curves have been glued, including the bottom allowance, and dried overnight so the tips can now be painted. I'm using the small paintbrush again to apply the glue so there shouldn't be any drips or runs on the inside of the crown. The PVA will dry too fast if I paint all of the tips at once so each of them can be done individually. Once the glue's been painted on I fold one side of the tip down and when it's good and stuck I apply some more glue and pushing the edge onto the shape I press the other side down. When I'm totally happy that it's good and tight and the point of the crown looks correct I use a cheap hair clip just to hold it in place while it dries. I use the cheap ones from the local pound shop. The reason is that they're made from less sturdy metal and don't hold as tightly, so they leave fewer marks in the crown after they've been 
dried. If the glued down edges look as though they need it, I also add some more glue, but not too much or the clip won't be able to be removed. Classic schoolgirl error. I'll skip showing all the tips being done and be back in a moment. Once the tips were dried, I realised that the crown would have to be held down and I've added these pieces of elastic, but none of the glues I used were strong enough to hold it on. So I punched holes all around the edge of the crown at top and bottom and stitched the lines with a waxed thread because the crown has to stay stable in high winds and rain. So the elastic will have a hook and eye closure to keep it on the client's head. I also used the top sewing line as a guide for the placing of the bridle looping, which hid it, and glued it on with a good strong contact adhesive. The bottom row of stitches I used to sew the front piece of bridle looping on the inside base. You can just about see all of my stitching around the top and bottom edges and I've brought the camera closer to the crown here for a better look. The inside piece of looping has been fitted to the front base of the crown so that it can be tied in with a piece of ribbon to the gable hood that I'm making for the crown to rest on. I need to hide my stitch line so I've added a couple of self-adhesive crystals and left them overnight to see if they'll stay fixed or not. As you can see, they have done, so I can now add more of them in total confidence. They come in these small sheets and I bought them at my local hobby craft store. They only come in a clear colour with a metallic adhesive backing. Although the clear ones are very sparkly, I need them to be red and used glass paint to get an even colour. They had to be painted and left to dry overnight. But the colour didn't spoil their sparkliness, I'm relieved to say. I cut the sheet with a small pair of nail scissors into three crystal widths and removing the backing, stuck them onto the crown in strips. This didn't work because I'd forgotten when you place flat items on a curved surface gaps appear which are too small to fill with spare crystals but large enough to be obvious as a mistake. Luckily I noticed before I'd got them all stuck down, removed them, cut them into squares of three by three crystals and stuck them down again. The adhesive takes a little while to cure which was very lucky but they were all stuck by the next day. The next part means finishing it with this pattern, which I cut out and transferred to the crown using the prick and pounce method. Before I put on the red pattern and glue in the lining, I put white crystals along the looping's edge. They reflect the light and will help the LED lights sparkle even more. Here's the finished crown being worn by the client and you can see the ribbon holding it to the gable hood, which can't be seen by anybody else. What can be seen are the red patterns, clear crystals and the lights. Here's a quick reminder of the look we were going for. The client looked absolutely amazing as we'd added lights and more crystals to the black velvet edge of the gable hood she was wearing. This is the full costume from the front and it was a big hit, not only with the client, but with the visitors as well. The next part is a video we took at Sudley Castle's Spectacle of Light, where the client performed nightly throughout December. I'll tell my costume maker she did work very well. Very nice. Is she? Oh yeah. Week and week. Weeks of... Weeks of, Weeks of gluing on crystals. <laughs> About a thousand of them. Give us a twirl, Chloe. You 
On the other side. There you go. <laughs> Good evening. Welcome, peasants, to the Queen's Garden. <laughs> we are the Queen of Hearts. You're very welcome to have your photo taken with us. <laughs> but if you want to pass us safely, girls should curtsy and boys should bow, at least try. Good, well done. <laughs> That's good. I'll never you know bow. Are you warm? Off with a head! No. <laughs> <laughs> the crown and its costume are finished. And I've also uploaded a tutorial on how to make the Queen's Wand. To see that and more videos, please subscribe to our channel and remember to like and share. Thanks for watching everyone. Blessings and light to you all. Big Dragon and Unicorn hugs.